It's car con carne. Let's eat in the car. It's car con carne. And now here's the star of our show. James Van Alstyle. So imagine this. After a night out, you pull into your driveway. The garage light comes on. You open the door to the mudroom. Mudrooms are great. The light there comes on. Walking into the house, the kitchen light comes on. Spotify comes alive with your favorite playlist or your favorite podcast. Maybe it's not loud enough. So one button from your phone or tablet cranks it up. Your home is in sync with you. That's what easy automation means. Experience seamless control over it all. Get a quote by visiting easy-automation.net or give my guy Dan a call. Dan can be reached directly at 630-730-3728. This right here is Carcone Carne. I'm James Van Osdell, and this episode is being recorded virtually. I don't do it that often, but geography was an issue for this one. My guest is a founding member of the band Orleans. He is bass guitarist and singer Lance Hoppen. Orleans returns to the Chicago area, Desplaines specifically, for a show at the Desplaines Theater on July 27th. Lance Hoppen. So Lance, this is a really interesting time we're living in. As we're recording this, I'm recording this on July 5th. Tomorrow, I'm going to see Daryl Hall play live. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the month, Orleans is back at the Displains Theater, July 27th. Uh, What is old is still new. I mean, here you are. The first Orleans album came out 51 years ago. 70, that's right. OMG. I mean, you were a kid when you joined the band. I was, literally, yeah. Uh, Do you remember at all what your ambitions were back in the day? Did did they extend much more beyond a couple years? Uh, From here, extending? Or are you talking, when when we talk about the the early part, the early days, like when you're when you're a kid, or right. is just kicking up. So I came from a musical family. My parents were players. They met on a gig. It was that kind of thing. My mother was very gifted singer and piano player. My dad was a really good horn player. Uh, he, you know, uh, started a business to raise a family. She kept playing gigs till she was forty. Taught students till she was sixty. And uh, there were four of us. My eldest sister. <clears throat> Um, and then Larry, my older brother, and Lane, my younger brother. And the three boys really took to it. I mean, Linda was, she dabbled, but Larry was prodigious. He would uh, play whatever he picked up, you know. He picked up, so keys, keys, guitars, he was trumpet, he was trained on a trumpet. And um, as was my younger brother trained on trumpet and a keyboard player. But I was um, given a clarinet when I was... uh, eight four, fourth grade i cried that night and i was but i played it for the next uh eight years or whatever that was my formal training but i gravitated to bass and i waited i had to wait till larry left the house really to uh uh not be intimidated and i uh, there was some guitar in the closet and i picked it up and i started plunking on the uh on the low e string and to mccarty lines and basically then eventually figured some stuff out, got into my first band at 14. But my aspiration, I started playing when I was 12. I got into my first uh, high, like junior high, high school band at 14. My aspiration was not to be rich or famous. It was to be a working musician. That's what I wanted to be. It was very clear about that. And I was hopefully do it with my brother, Larry. And so, so lo and behold, you know, fast forward, Orleans started as a trio, started as Larry, uh, started with John Hall, actually, um, recruiting Wells Kelly from the band he was in with Larry, which broke that band up. For And uh, that's an interesting story in and of, in and of itself. But they, uh, so John and Wells and a couple of guys tried to make a band and couldn't, and then they got, they recruited Larry. So the trio started in February of 72, and I went to see them as a, as a high school senior a couple of times. A couple of times. They were awesome as a trio. Awesome. They they switched instruments at will, and it always sounded good no matter who was playing what. Um, but they wanted to stabilize, expand. And so I graduated high school in um, um, June, and uh, by October I was in Orleans 
like that. And then we recorded our first album the next summer. So that was my aspiration, and it was manifested really early on. And then, of course, we uh, climbed the ladder from there. Mission accomplished. You mentioned plunking along McCartney lines on the open E string. I mean, was that your childhood listening to the Beatles? Is that how you came up as a music fan? Well, we listened to everything. You know, back then, radio played everything. I mean, right. You know, it was AM radio and all styles and, you know, whatever was popular, but it was ran the gamut. So we were influenced by everything from the very white Paul Anka, Bobby Vint and stuff to the Beach Boys to the Birds and, um, you know, as we, as we went on. Um, Motown was a big deal um, as influences, but we also had folk, Pete Parla Mary. Sure. Uh, and um, classical from training and then... Um, and the Beatles came along, the English Invasion, right? And the, and the Stones and Hermits, Hermits, and all those bands, right? Um, but I was a really a big, big Beatles fan, and who wasn't? And then when they, they hit Ed Sullivan, that was just a seminal night for so many of us in that generation. When we saw that, it was like, Katie barred the door. That's what I want to do, you know? I think, you know. So, so from that point forward, it was like, yeah, we, we can do this. And uh, yeah, they were. My, uh, they still are my favorites of all time. And uh, McCartney's bass playing is very unique in its melodic structures and such. He's not, you know, he's not a slam, slam, funk, funk. Play. You know, he's not a sure. jazz or he's not, in, you know. But it was. I just gravitated to that melodic. Um, they were just great. What, what can I say? And he was a big influence, and they were a big influence. So that's kind of core. But there are so many other elements that fed into my style, and also, um, and also, you know, playing in high school in the band I was in, we, um, <clears throat> we had four. I was in the concert band. We had four horn players from the concert band and a five-piece rhythm section, and we would do the hits of the day, a lot of uh, soul music, um, a lot of uh, Chicago, that kind of thing. And I carried that all forward um, uh, with me, and. Um, then Orleans, you know, uh, John was big into reggae before it was really big, and we were kind of the one of the very first um, American bands playing Americanized reggae, uh, along with R and B and funk and rock and roll, and then uh, eventually Dance with Me, which was very atypical of the mainstream of what we did. But um, after having had Let There Be Music crack the door at radio, Dance with Me just walked right through, and then that would get that tended to tell us what it is you know it, it, it pigeonholed us for a bit you know mm -hmm. in that soft rock thing uh as opposed to um the harder edges of, of what we were doing the more the funkier uh more rock um bar band kind of stuff uh, so much of what you said i want to dive into yeah there's just, there's just so much i'm trying to, to encapsulate it for you i remember i mean the first time i heard orleans was in the back seat of my parents' car on AM radio. Mm -hmm. The first time I heard Dance With Me and, and still the one. I, I don't think it can be overstated how important radio was to developing artists back right. in the day. I mean, here you are in 2024. You're recording for a podcast. You've seen every possible shift in the music industry. You, you've weathered them all. Do you think for an artist starting today, it's easier or harder to gain a toehold? Uh, on the world maybe both i don't know i mean what what we, what we were able to do was hone our craft by playing you know four or five nights a week three four or five nights a week um writing songs testing them out developing you know and then and and labels would let you develop a bit you know like they would put a if your first album didn't do so well you could do a second album and if that didn't do so maybe do a third album like that right now but so we were able to um, develop into whoever we were going to become. Like when I said I joined and, and I, I, was, I was the bass player, that's what I did, I played bass. That allowed John and Larry, who were both guitar players, to start developing the double guitar thing. Mm -hmm. And our vocal style, we had four singers now. and So we were able to, you know, do that and do it while we were working and making money. And then we got a record deal and you get a manager, you, get, you go on tour so that and you build a following and radio is the means to do that that's how how you do it that's how it was done <clears throat> today it's all well you have a laptop in your home in your bedroom and you make a a, a single 
and you put it out on a Spotify or whatever, and and suddenly you're you're a hit or not. And there was no common. There's the thing about radio back in the day. Everybody listened to the same thing. Yeah, we all know basically the catalog, give or take, of the '60s or the '70s. You know, even the '80s. <clears throat> but then with the internet, um, everything's sliced and diced. You know, it's it's factionalized and. There are huge stars. I, I don't, I, you know, I know nothing about them. I don't know. I mean, I know their names maybe, but I have never heard anything they did. Or I never uh, put together that song with that artist because there's nothing, you know, unless you're into that genre, there's nothing connecting the stuff. So I think I, to answer your question, it, it, you can probably, if you're good at social media, if you're, if you have a really hit sound or something or you're different or unique you know you're cutting edge you know, the billy eilish is you know that kind of, you know they come out of the woodwork mm-hmm. um, like tracy chapman came out of the woodwork but that was again it was radio and it was different so so it's hard to say what you can't do these days i don't think you can't like make a living playing gigs uh and then and then have a and then like hit radio you know that's not how it's done it's like the opposite way. I think it started with um, like Dave Matthews, where he had he had developed like twenty thousand fans or something, and then the record label says, "Okay, that's enough. We'll take you now." You know? Exactly. Right? right. So, so it's ass backwards that way. Um, so I don't know if it's easier or harder. It's different. Let's say that. Well, you talked about labels developing bands and, and growing. I mean, the Orleans experience was was not perfect out of the gate i mean after the, the second album the band got dropped right we made the first album we had we got support from college radio and such in the northeast and 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 mainstream radio and um we it was it remains a like a, a cult favorite of our fan base the first album very funky very raw um we made the second album in the same kind of mold um um, but the label hated it, and 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 so they dropped us. And ironically, both "Let There Be Music" and "Dance with Me" were on that album. But the, uh, so when we got dropped, we went back to New York City to showcase again and played this week long gig. And we got um, picked up by Asylum, by like Chuck Puck, and heard us on the last set of the last night. So the legend goes. <laughs> I think I think that's true. It's the story I've been telling a long time. <laughs> but. Uh, so he not only liked the band, he heard those songs for what they were. And so he acquired the re-recording rights and we cut them again. And the difference in, there wasn't a difference in the song. It was a difference in the production, mm-hmm. the presentation. And that's where Chuck taught us a lot. So that's that, that was the difference there. And that's, so we did the two albums for Asylum. We had, uh to Be Music was a minor hit. Dance With Me was a big hit. Still, the one was a bigger hit, and then uh, of course the band had a breakup, and then go into the story later on. You know, hey, my God, the mid seventies. What what a moment for your band, Orleans. Dance with me, number six. Still, the one, number five. Love takes time, number eleven. I mean, on top of the world at that moment. What, do, you, do you have any memories of those days? Like when as did things just explode? It was just no time to catch your breath or were you able to take inventory of what was going on? Um, it, you know, generally speaking, I was the junior partner. I was the young kid. I was, it. I was faking it. I thought it's like the get these guys haven't figured it out yet, you know, but they were all more, they were older. They're more accomplished. They had done sessions. They'd done, they were writers they played with this guy and that guy. I was just, you know, the kid who came in at the back door and uh, and and they let me in. And and as we grew, you know, there was uh, I was not the lead singer. I was a, I was my voice actually made a difference, but I didn't realize it at the time. But I was not. I was just the bass player. You know what I mean? And 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 went and just ha- hung on um, as we. <laughs> As we went up, but I wasn't, nobody really noticed me, you know, it was always John and Larry or maybe Wells because he was so, uh, he was exciting to play. He was a very unique and fantastic drummer. Um, and I just, I just held it, hold, held it together, you know, like quietly. And um, I never really, uh, so I, I did, I was very shy, really shy. 
I was very stoned most of the time. Um, and I went through those years that way. And it, even when we uh, toured in 76 with Jackson Brown, still the one climbing the charts, Jackson, I, I love Jackson. He was like one of my favorites. Did I have a conversation with the man the whole summer? No, not a single one, you know? So that's, that's how I recall those days. I mean, and then later on, you know, we played uh, one of the bigger gigs, was like Woodstock 94. We played yeah. 150,000 people basically in our backyard. I mean, I've had these experiences from, you know, crying when five people came and, you know, we were like de destitute to, uh, to that and it, it all and everything in between. So, and the seventies were like, you know, from 72 to 77 was all upswing. Yeah. And then John left the band and then we were like, boom, down, like, boom, down and out. Then we had to rebuild and came back and had Love Takes Down was a hit, right? And that was the second coming. Uh, but then everything fell apart. The 80s were, you know, the you have to remember, 79, 80, there was an oil shortage. There was inflation. There was a, labels were cutting rosters and, mm -hmm. and, and employees and vinyl was being melted down to be reused because of the oil thing and people were lining up for gas. I mean, that was the early eighties. And, uh, and so it really hit us hard and we took it on the chin and had to kind of rebuild. It, um, like we, we actually, Larry and I actually quit. We quit in 84. We said, we're done. And, and no sooner had we done, had we done that, <clears throat> that Wells passed away. Um, he was on tour with Meat well, Meatloaf. He passed away. Uh, uh, he had a rock and roll death. It was really kind of tragic. But there was a memorial. And I couldn't go because I, I had a job. I was working. And uh, Larry and John met on stage at the memorial after seven years of not having played or, you know, all this friction. Mm -hmm. And they said, wow, this is really good. We should probably do this. And then they got me involved and we made some more demos and then, you know, we picked up the ball and ran from there. So the big scoop out, you know, um, to the bottom and then slowly back up and the nineties were okay, but you know, hey. and on and on <clears throat> through the story. What's amazing really is that here in year 52 that we're working at all, but that, and, and and I'm the last guy standing. I mean, Larry yeah. passed in 2012, which was really, that's a whole other thing we could talk about, but that was cataclysmic, sure. catastrophic. And um, somehow we resurrected again, and John came back for, and but he retired from the road in uh, 22. So here I am, the kid, who <laughs> is now the, the elder. The elder uh the globe you know who's carrying on the tradition uh of the band playing the band's music uh and we're doing a really good job but it's not the, the old band and it doesn't have the benefit of the driving forces which were basically john and larry you know so and i make this analogy I, i've seen the doobies recently right so mm -hmm. they got Pat and they got tom johnston and they got michael mcdonald and they got a great band but the rest of the guys don't really matter it only matters that pat and tom and, and michael are there so they have the benefit of that, right? right? But if you take them out and just have the band and plug in some other guys, it's not the same thing, right? It's it's not not inherently the same as it was then. So I, I struggle with that part of it, where I'm the link to the past, but also driving present and hopefully some future. Um, it, so it's it, kind of like it's a privilege, and it but it's a big responsibility. And again. Displays Theater on July 27th. It's interesting the way music is cyclical in terms of styles finding favor with audiences off and on through the years. I, I think, I mean, I'm holding this book right here for those who are just listening. It's the Yacht Rock book, which you are interviewed for. I, I think there's a real interest in those sounds, those 1970s sounds, those really beautifully produced melodic songs. When I think about Orleans, you were making music that was very different from rock and roll at the time. You weren't Ted Nugent. You weren't ACDC. You were singing songs, or the band was performing songs about tenderness and and romance and vulnerability. 
really the antithesis of rock cliches. Part of that was the fact that jo- John's then wife and writing partner, Johanna, was the was the his primary lyricist. Like they were, they wrote together, mm-hmm. but she was the the female. You know, she had that sensibility, and she was very literate. She came from a literate family, right? We came from musical families, right? So there was that element, which is which is you hear it everywhere uh, in that in the romantic stuff, but also in the intelligent imagery um, and and such. And then there's the kind of social commentary that John would interject: songs like "Cold Spell" or "Power" or um, "It All Comes Back," or I mean, a lot of stuff that, <clears throat> yeah, it it was it, it was more intelligent maybe let's say mm-hmm. it's like higher higher thought um and there was some dark stuff but basic but on the on the whole the messaging in the lyrics are very optimistic and positive and um peace generating and you know kumbaya you know i mean like that in fact when we do a live show of you know 12 15 songs whatever there's only one song that's negative like like is is uh like minor key, my uh, slipping away. It's like I know your love is slipping away, slipping away. It was a, from the uh, from the Forever album, I think. So in a in a in a in a every song being up positive, you know, blah blah blah. And then there's what this one kind of gritty thing, and then it's oh it's all fluffy again. So I, I I'm aware of that, and uh, um. <clears throat> But it, you know, it's all it's all part of the whole, basically. Mm-hmm. Thinking about well, thinking about this book again, mm-hmm. uh, you're quoted talking about fashion, saying that in general, been there, done that, wouldn't want to do it again. As far as the looks of the of uh-huh. the seventies, let's talk about the album cover for Waking and Dreaming. Mm-hmm. Um, the basic theme of the cover is, "Who's ready for the hot tub? Let's go." Well. The story of that is uh, the, the, the the label sent us to the over to Norman Norman Seif, very famous rock uh, photographer, sent us to the studio. No concept of what to shoot, you know, just shooting portrait, whatever. We were like the doing, and he said, "You guys are you guys are so stiff. Take these shirts off. Let's see what happens." You know, it's like models are walking around. There's wine. It's like. <laughs> It's all this LA thing, right? And uh, and that's what happened. And then so we took our shirts off, and then <clears throat> you got those shots. And you have to understand, it's the the title of the album is "Waking and Dreaming." So there were shots with our, all our eyes open, and there were shots with all our eyes closed. And what they did it was pre Photoshop. It's called airbrushing. So they took John's head and flip and inverted it so that four eyes open one John's clothes and vice versa. So waking, dreaming, two-sided mm-hmm. cover, right? That was a whole, that was a whole of the idea. But all people know is they, they look at that, they go, what the hell? And, <laughs> and, and uh, it, be, there was it, uh, somebody on the internet made the hundred worst album covers of all time. Oh, oh no. And we were among that group, but I'll tell you what, there were, we were not, we must, you know, we were not anywhere near as, as bad as most of those unbelievably <laughs> horrific covers. But we also were the cover of the hard co- hard cover book co- of that. We were on the cover of the hard copy of the hundred worst album covers of all time. And just con- just to finish the thought, at the same time, Pablo Cruz had an album cover where they were all ab- ab- actually naked. And kneeling and such, you know, not exposing anything. But nobody ever says anything about that. What's up well, with be- that? Well, it's because their bigger hit, their biggest hit, was on a different album. I, I don't know what it was, you know, and I and I, and I know those guys, and, and that's fine. It's just like it's a double standard thing. But anyway, <laughs> we get a lot of uh, get a lot of chuckles out of that and conversations, and you know, it's like all press is good press, right? For sure. Since I mentioned Yacht Rock, to me, it feels like it could be a pejorative term it, or just reductive. It, it doesn't really accurately I, like George Benson existing in the same space as the Doobies, as Orleans, seems like a very big umbrella. Yeah, it's, it's a little wide. 
I mean, so, you could you could say the Michael McDonald Doobie stuff is yacht rock. Hall and Oates is yacht, yacht rock. I mean, that's kind of the center of it, I think. Right, and then get you get other like and player, who who uh, incidentally Peter Beckett's on this show with us. Mm-hmm. Right? That fits the thing, and I guess to a degree we do as well, you know. But and it's not a bad thing it, to be included in that. It's just you know, it's just a thing that somebody wanted to make uh, a branding, you know, like a yeah. trade, you know, like a thing, right? And so, speaking of brandy, right? That's a, that's a song that falls into that category <laughs> yes. as well, right? Um, so I, you know, I don't mind it. Uh, we, they used to call it soft rock or right. M- MOR, middle of the road, you know, um, which is a little bit different. Um, we on that score, when we had dance with me as a hit, we toured with Melissa Manchester. That was MOR. Barry, Barry sure. Manilow was MOR, right? And dance with me kind of put us in MOR for a while. Still, the one brought us back more toward, you know, pop rock. Um, so it's just, you know, categories, categories, categories. And now even today, everything is even more sliced and diced. than For sure. Right? What does it feel like to play Still the One in the present day and watch the crowd react to it? I, I feel like it has such a deep connection with people. Like it, it, people are able to forget all the BS of their lives when they hear that song. It's just, it. it to your point earlier, it's a positive song. Yeah. And it's a... Um... It's a nostalgia thing with the boomers for sure, sure. you know, because they're they're remembering. Oh, I remember when I was blah 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 blah. Or I've been married for forty years. That's our song. Or the moon. Right. Or you know, to a lesser degree, you know, I kissed my first girl to dance with me. You know, whatever. So there's that element of it. And yeah, in the in the course of a show, people know we're going to play still one at the end. And when we do, if they've been sitting, they're up. You know. Yep. So it's it's that kind of thing, and they just connect to it and threw it to the band. Um, people, even to this day, they know those songs a lot more than they know who did them. We mm-hmm. were not, we were not branded well, like the Eagles, you know what I mean? Or, you know, it, that didn't happen. It wasn't, it, it, the marketing machinery didn't put that stuff together. We were, t- we were too short at any one label mm-hmm. that anybody could put it together. So, say Orleans and they go what and I go still the one. Oh yeah 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 got it you know so it, that's still the story of my life so you mentioned Larry a couple times he passed 12 years ago mm-hmm. as people listen to the music of the band or see you on stage at the Displays Theater on July 27th what would you like them to know about your brother you know there's actually a moment where I take uh I take um I take a minute to go there because you know, as important as John Hall was to the creation of the band and it's uh, a lot of the material and a lot of it. John quit the band five times, five times. Larry never missed a gig. Larry was there at every part of it. I, du- I ducked out for a couple of years to come to Nashville and had to like straddle the fence. But he was the singer of the hits. He was guitar player, keyboard player, melodica player, bass player. Uh, he wrote Love Takes Time, he wrote Spring Fever, he wrote a bunch of other, you know, he was the backbone, really, the unsung, and people said John Hall, John Hall, John Hall, and I get that, and I have every respect for John and his accomplishments and his guitar playing and his his singing, phrasing and such, but Larry had that voice, you know, and that made, made all the difference. At, what happened was, we didn't know, John wrote, John Johanna wrote the hits, Larry sang them. And then Larry wrote and sang Love Takes Time, which was a lesser than the other two. But that was that was the magic combination. Um, so when he died tragically in 2012, um, boy, well, what do I say about that? John had been out of the band because he'd been in Congress at those years. Right. Larry, the last song I wrote with Larry and Sonny LaMare of Exile, actually, three of us, it's called No More Than You Can Handle. It's a song about perseverance in the face of adversity. It's about faith and and hanging in there uh, and all will be okay. Well, that was the last song we wrote in 2010. And then two years later, he took his own life. So the irony does not, uh, I'm, you know, that doesn't escape me. And so I kind of, I honor everybody who ever came through this band has been about 
20 of us, 20 of us. If you count them all, who came and went. Um, but Larry was key and um, and irreplaceable, you know. Uh, so we do our best to fill the the gap, fill the hole he left. Um, and I think we do a good job. I mean, you'll you'll hear at the show. Tom Lane, my my guitar player, my tenor singer, sounds great. He's great, great singer. And he brought in his buddy Tony Hooper. He's the newest guy in the band when Fly Amaro had a quit uh, last year. Tony's a great player, <clears throat> great player. So this band really kills it. Um, but it's not me, Larry, John, Wells. It's not that. It's um, like I said, over the years. Guys have come and gone. The band has morphed version, 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 and uh, to where we get to today. So it's, it's an evolution of things, and Larry is sorely missed, as is John, but really Larry's the one who, you know, if you had an F, you know, it, it, he was a guy who could go, uh, like if some other band, like and he was in this organization where there was a bunch of hit singers and one backing band. And he could go and he could be Orleans because he had that voice. He could represent, <laughs> right? None of us can do that. Right. Right. And uh, now, ironically, that's what I did. I have a whole other career of being music director on multi act shows where other with singers of other bands come and represent and we, we back them. So it's, it's inverted. I do want to mention, though, again, that on this Des- Desplane show, mm-hmm. It's Orleans, but it's also Peter Beckett from Player, and we'll be playing his hit, those pits, Baby Come Back, a couple other things he does. Walter Egan, Magnus, Magnus, Magnus Great song. Steel. So we've done this before, and um, so they will be integrated their material in the course of our ninety or ninety or whatever two hour show um, at this place. I love it. What a great night, and it's a Saturday night too. I mean, come on. And we're and we're doing it the night before too in Fort Wayne, so we we will have it under our belt. It, it'll be maybe better. Yeah, you, you'll have the the Midwest sewn up. Yeah, over the, over the course of a weekend, we, uh, should know, we should know it by then. Yeah, I, I would imagine. So, okay, again, the twenty seventh at the Displays Theater. It is Orleans. It is Walter Egan. It is Peter Beckett, the voice of Player. Uh, what a night of music! The fact that we're here talking about Orleans in twenty twenty four is nothing short of awesome. Yeah, yeah, I'm very grateful for it to still be work, being able to work. I'm 70 years old now. I started when I was 18 in this band. So imagine that. I mean, that's totally unpredictable and a blessing, and uh, uh, and I don't forget that every day. And for people who are just listening and perhaps not watching the video, when you say that, it looks like you've reversed the aging process because you do not look (laughs) like a 70-year-old man. Uh, Thank you. Maybe maybe rock and roll keeps you young. Maybe that's the secret. Yeah. I don't know. It could have been all that pickling early on. <laughs> you never know. Yeah, vinegar goes a long way. Yeah. 